like I open and I just like blast out and I get all wet like with my clothes and everything <laughs> and there's nothing more embarrassing that like you have to go meet with the team at seven in the morning down at the lobby and your shirt's wet and they ask you what happened I turned on the sink when I was gonna brush my teeth and just spat at me <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Feeder Series podcast. With all of the action in the Middle East, we're keeping our focus this winter on all the action in Kuwait and Dubai. I'm your host, Jim Kimberly, and we're going to talk through all of the things that have been happening over in Formula Regional Middle East. And to do so, we have a driver joining us who has battled through nine races so far in 2023 in only the last few weeks after 2022 filled with Formula Regional racing and ahead of a 2023 debut in Formula 3. A very warm welcome to the podcast, Sebastian Montoya. How are you? We've just been speaking and you are stuck in an airport. So how's everything going on your side? <laughs> hey, thanks for having me. Um, oh, it's been good. A little bit of mayhem here, but besides that, all good. I'm here already in Dubai. Yeah, and you're all kitted out as well, looking good. And anybody who is uh, <laughs> listening rather than watching, there's even hand luggage sitting right next to him to add to the experience of traveling <laughs> through the Middle East. Right here. Always right here, my necessities. <laughs> and also joining me for the very first time in 2023, but a frequent fixture on the podcast is our Formula 2 editor. But more pertinently for today, he is a pertinently a word, Tyler, is, uh, is also a Formula Regional Middle East editor and our food fanatic. Tyler Foster, Happy New Year. How are you? I'm great. I'm, I'm great to be back. Racing's back. Everything's good. I'm looking like a tomato. I don't know why I'm so red, but I haven't been on holiday or anything. I'm stuck in rainy, grey England. So, yeah, the best I've, uh, I've got out of it is watching racing in the Middle East so far. So that's that's my holiday, is watching racing in, in somewhere else in the world that's sunny. So, yeah, <laughs> at, least, at least Sebastian's getting about, I guess. Maybe the sunshine is going through the television onto your face. From, well, some of the stuff that happened in race one of round three wasn't so sunny, but we'll get on to that in a yeah, second. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say the weather <laughs> has been a bit up and down here as well. All right. Well, before we get started, if you enjoy the podcast, please like, comment and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube or leave a rating or review if you're listening. You can leave a rating on Spotify and review us on Apple Podcasts. We've had about 50 or so episodes now and the 4.9 star rating on Spotify. Very proud of that. And we're pushing towards getting 2,000 subscribers on YouTube. Hopefully you're going to do that before the season starts. So if you haven't rated or subscribed, please take 10 seconds to do so. It really does help us out and gets us great guests like Sebastian and the other names we've fought to get you throughout 2022. And while we're in the pre-season of Formula 2 and Formula 3, the podcast schedule might be a little bit less regular than usual. Please just bear with us. We'll be back to our regular programming in March. Finally, if you haven't already, do check out Transfer Weekly, our second show on the channel, which keeps you up to date on all the driver announcements in the off-season, hosted by the excellent Chris McCarthy. It's definitely the time for the Middle East to shine quite literally, uh, right now. And Sebastian, I do want to hear from you about that, but we'll ask you that in a moment. But first, as this is your debut on the podcast and the podcast launched last year, I thought it'd be a good time to ask how you felt 2022 went because you got podiums galore. You got that fantastic cameo appearance in Formula 3. How do you remember 2022? Honestly, I think about it more as a growth experience. Like, obviously... I started the year racing here as well with the Mumbai Falcons by Prema. And honestly, it was a really interesting start. Like I never expected to start the year with such a big high, getting my first pole position and my first win, like straight off the bat. And then just kind of being really competitive, getting three pole positions in a row, getting two wins and then another podium. And yeah, honestly, it's quite funny because I started the year in Europe really competitively in regional like I was always in the top five I was always fighting with my teammates like I was right there with my teammates and I was still missing a lot with my driving and then as the year progressed I the results weren't really showing it but the step I made with my driving honestly gave me a bit of a confidence boost as well but kind of like mixed with your head 
because I wasn't only doing regional. I was also did that F3 race that you mentioned. And I also was racing in the U.S. in LMP2. And honestly, when you do really good, it, obviously you love it. Like you love winning. You love leading races. You love finishing on the podium. But when you do bad, that's when you learn the most because that's when it's harder on yourself. Like I hate to say it, but like also this, the start of the year hasn't been the easiest. And even like that, the way I've progressed and just see my driving from round one to now and last year from the beginning of the season to now, it's actually quite cool to see it in a way because even though I started the year with a pole position and a win, I, I was still making a lot of mistakes. I wasn't driving the best. I wasn't the best driver that I could be. And just seeing the progression I made was honestly massive. And especially doing like the F3 race after the summer break and just coming back just for one random race just to do an appearance. It actually came out really good and it was a good confidence boost to see that even though the results weren't showing in Formula Regional, in F3, I was able just kind of to go in and boom, like be on the pace straight away. Practice wasn't easy enough to say. And it was like a lot of hard work to prepare it. But honestly, it's been fun. It's been a huge learning curve and I hope I get a bit more results out of it. But yeah, we'll see in the future how it goes. I cannot wait to see how your season goes this year. You how how you burst onto the scene. We were very effusive about how well you did in that in that debut race in Formula Three. So goal that to come. Let's switch back and fast forward or how however you want to do it into the Middle East, and you're getting familiar with your high-tech team right now, but I want to bring up just a quote which I was on Red Bull's press release from round three, which you said that I think we made a good step from last week. There are still some things I think the engine is still not right. It makes it quite unfair. We're losing a bit of time with that, but the team did an amazing job and we really moved forwards. Now, that has been a thing with the team that have really struggled high-tech in Kuwait in particular, what can you tell us about this? Because it, I know you, you, you seem to be doing so well and you had some collisions. You've had a bit of up and down and it's been, like you said, a bit tricky. But how much of a deficit has there been from performance, if you can go through that? Yeah, obviously, well, starting here in Dubai, actually, a couple of weeks ago, we had round one. And I think round one was quite interesting because... I felt quite confident going into the weekend. I felt like it was a track that I knew quite well, especially after last year's performance and the speed that we had. I felt that we could go in somewhat of a good way. And then we just had a lot of issues and a lot of problems. Like, for example, in Q1 here in Dubai, I made a small mistake from my side in the first lap that kind of got the lap deleted and I went wide and I made a mistake. And then by the time I went out after the red flag for my second lap, I went three times quicker than my two teammates, which one of them was on pole, but the tires already dropped the second. So it was kind of unlucky there. And then for Q2, we had an engine issue, like one of the cables in the engine disconnected. And I was just losing a lot of power. So that kind of messed up that. And then in, the, in round one and round two, we were really unlucky with the races because of some incidents, collisions, mistakes. And I guess it happens like, as I told my team, like, as long as it happens now and we're better in F3, then I'm fine with that. But it was really difficult, especially, like, on myself because I felt like I was really making a step forward with the driving and finally understanding how the team works. Uh, high tech is really different mentality from what I'm used to. Mm. Um, and I think it's quite good. I'm, I'm actually starting to like it a lot. And I feel like the driver can progress in a different manner, which is kind of what I needed, if you know what I mean. Like yeah. a kind of change of pace from what I was used to in previous teams in previous years. And it's just a, kind of like a new way to develop the driver, which I feel like I was missing a little bit, which at the beginning you could see a little. But now, especially last week, and even though, as I said, the engine wasn't the best, then we're still missing a little power in the team overall. Uh, yeah, I can't wait to see how you do in F3 because you're talking about doing stuff with high tech and that's it's, you're right that is where you expect them to be Tyler you've been watching all of this you've been writing about all of this as well uh first time on the podcast this year how have you been enjoying the Middle Eastern Championship this is like the winter series it really kicks everything off and the, the Kuwait rounds have been sensational to watch once you get past the, the first safety cars and the first laps but in the first few races how have you enjoyed it yeah really good I think the change from uh, Formula Regional Asia that Sebastian did last year with my Falcons to the Middle Eastern Championship solely. I mean, I know last year it was Middle East anyway, but they've added in Kuwait. I think that's gone well. So I, I literally, they kept using Sebastian's uh, quotes on how good the circuit was and how you know unique it was. And obviously, when you've got a desert to build a, a new circuit, you have a lot of options. And that sweeping turn two provided a lot of uh, 
Well, a lot of collisions, but the reason why I provided <laughs> a lot of collisions was because it was a it was a really good corner and there was a lot of really good action into there. So we have seen some really good battles. We've seen Antonelli and Barnard get at it. Um, you know, even though Antonelli's 44 points in, in the lead at the championship at the moment, there still looks to be, you know, a lot of racing still to be done in terms of individual battles. The midfield battle was really exciting. It's one of those ones where sometimes that's more exciting than what's going on at the front. You know, when you have a safety car and then a couple of laps go in, you've got so many drivers who are going to be in um, as, as rookies next year stepping up into different series who are all competing in one series here. And it's really interesting seeing drivers from different age categories, different groups. Mm-hmm. And that's what Formula Regional Middle East does. It gives the opportunity for drivers to sort of test themselves against people that they wouldn't usually race against. Um, but yeah, it's been really exciting. You get to see some different teams as well. PHM are in there. They're doing quite a good job as well, considering this is just a second year still in in racing. Um, but yeah, it's been a good a good series so far. We move away from Kuwait back to Dubai for round four and then to Yas Marina for round five in, um, I think, three or four weeks. So yeah, still a bit to go until we get to obviously March and, and to F3 and F2. But it's been uh, certainly, I think, an upgrade from how things have been for the last few years. It's certainly improving. Uh, the standard is definitely getting better. It's been such entertainment for us as we are craving some European racing or the, the, the season proper with Formula 2 and Formula 3, I suppose. And one thing I just wanted to ask for both of you, but particularly interested in Sebastian's answer, this track, you are one of the first, well, Formula drivers to have ever taken to it, so very little prep. It looks fantastic. Like, in terms of, I had no idea what to expect, and it just seems to have the best bits of multiple tracks that I've seen. And we spoke to Kimi Antonelli, and he was... Uh, and Michael, Michael McClure on our, on our previous podcast. And there was just a comment which I never thought about. It's so different from Formula Regional and F3 as well, mostly F3, where you usually race on very European tracks of um, classic venues, I'd call them. This is more of a Tilka type circuit. How have you enjoyed it? Because I think it's really shot into a, a fan favorite already, Sebastian. Yeah, honestly, from my side, it's probably one of the best tracks I've ever driven. Like, I know it's quite weird to say, but it's like, I would probably say it's one of the few high-speed tracks where you can still overtake. Like, there's a lot of racing, for example, Mugello, and Mugello, for me, it's one of the best tracks in Europe. But the problem with Mugello is that you cannot follow the far ahead. Here, I don't know why, but the way they built it causes so much overtaking, especially with the long straight. And, like, the corners being so long that both the high downforce and the low downforce setup mm-hmm. works. Like, it's quite interesting because I was at the end of race three, I was fighting with Via Gomez and he had really high downforce and I had really low downforce. So it made it really interesting because I was able to catch him in the last lap and we were side by side going into turn one. And then by the time we got to turn five and six, we were still side by side. And it's just kind of like, okay, so it's the last lap. I don't want to crash, but I don't want to give up the position either. So for me, honestly, it's incredible. Like honestly, kudos to them because the track they built is honestly mega and just, Hopefully we can go back there in the future because just the racing and also the facilities of the trucks are really cool and I really enjoyed it. What do you think, uh, Tyler, with um, some more quotes, which are no doubt they're going to be using? Yeah. Do you think it's so great as well from a fan perspective? Well, obviously you don't get the full uh, view of it when you're sat there watching it on a YouTube live stream, but from everything that the drivers have been saying about it, um, something that I think is really important when you have a, a, a circuit that's been built in the Middle East, especially where you have all this resources and facilities, is that you incorporate things that work in old school circuits. And the, the key thing always I find is elevation. And that's what they've done there. Uh, you might not be able to tell as much, I think, watching it on, on YouTube or you know TV, but the Kuwait Motor Town circuit has actually got a lot of elevation you know, in, in both senses. And I think that has an effect on the racing. You know, Sebastian's saying about he's not sure why they're able to follow there. I think the the the, the combination of the high speed and then the low speed um, throughout parts of the of of the circuit make the lap really good when you're following. It makes it just so that when you come to the final sector and then you start the lap, you've got that really long sort of double straight into turn two, and then you've got all of the squiggly sections throughout squiggly. as well. The sort of yeah, the sort of, I think uh, Jake Sanson, the commentator, I think he called it the corkscrew. Um, it sort of has that effect. It's not obviously as, as as strong as, say, a Laguna Seca level corkscrew, but it's certainly the elevations there. 
And I think that to, to have younger drivers sort of be the first to test it out is the is the best thing to do because they're going to be the ones who are going at it fully. They're they're people who you know are sort of haven't you know haven't had this experience before. Whereas if they just stuck it in say a Formula One calendar straight off the bat, you know a lot of those drivers have raced at circuits you know like that before. And that's the thing when you compare somewhere like Kuwait. Uh, motor town to Yas Marina where there is no elevation and it's a bit more of a sort of I call it a car park I think I think realistically this is a much better Middle Eastern circuit than Yas Marina is so um, hopefully we get to see a lot more racing there in Kuwait because not only does it host a lot of different uh, events in terms of the changes that you can make to the circuit there's multiple layouts and yeah it's, it's certainly done a good job I think as in its advent um, in Formula Regional Middle East. Absolutely, I couldn't say it better myself. We could talk about Formula Regional Middle East, but honestly, I have to say, Sebastian, the amount of questions, Tyler even texted me just before the podcast saying how many questions you've attracted from our fans, extremely high, extremely high. So that's enough questions for me because the Feeder Series podcast is for you, viewers and listeners. We're going to move on to the hashtag AskFS part of the podcast. If this is your first time watching or listening, you can get involved by using the hashtag AskFS on Twitter, joining our Discord and using the Podcast Questions channel, commenting on our YouTube videos, or by keeping an eye out on our Instagram posts and stories. There are so many questions, Sebastian. You're extremely popular, and I went through them, and I've categorized them, which is something I've never had to do before. And I think we can put them into five categories, and I'll let you choose where we start. So I've put them into racing, life, Red Bull, Juan Pablo, and food. Which one would you like to start at? I'll start with food. (laughs) <laughs> Tyler and you were going to get on famously. <laughs> um, okay, food. The first question is from <laughs> Leila Valente via Discord. A brilliant question. We've not had this before. <laughs> if you could taste your life, what would it taste like? And then they put in brackets at the end, yes, I don't know either. <laughs> if you could taste your life, what would it taste like? Oh, I'd champagne? have to say recently. No, I'm too young for champagne. Just oh. that's that's something to point out. I'm too young for champagne. But I would probably have to say recently. I'd have to say like the Red Bull Sugar Free. Like that's been <laughs> on it recently. Like that's been that's been a lifesaver recently. Like ever since I got the deal. Um, I've always tried the Red Bull Normal, but I never tried the Sugar Free. And then I ordered both. For my house and then the first time i tried the sugar free i just stayed with it that thing like for the same before quality practice if i have to wake up i just anything a red bull sugar free me and my sister especially my sister my older sister paulina she loves it so i'd have to say red bull sugar free <laughs> if that counts it, it counts you're so on brand it's brilliant and tyler you put the next question <laughs> Yeah, this is one that we've had for a few people. We asked, uh, infamously, we asked Teo Paul share this question and he gave a bit of pretty disturbing answer. Um, Ashley via Discord asks, um, Seb, what is your favourite cheese? Oh, wow. That's interesting. I'm not really yeah. sure. It's quite funny because I'm not really like a cheese guy, but probably mozzarella, especially because like, I love mozzarella sticks. Everywhere I go, if they have mozzarella sticks on the menu, I'll order. It's not the healthiest choice, but I have to say it's really good. Like, it's a good snack. It's like a good appetizer, if you want to say it like that. Yeah. I'll tell you something, Seb. Um, if, if you're talking about Red Bull sugar-free, and then you're worrying about appearing health conscious <laughs> with your mozzarella <laughs> sticks, I don't think those two go hand in hand so much. Good answer, though. Good answer. If uh, anyone's going to date Sebastian, get Red Bull and some mozzarella sticks, make him very happy. And you can find out in the next question from Joe Aiden via Instagram what to feed him because he asked, what is your favorite dish? It's a Colombian plate called arroz con pollo, basically chicken and rice. And they've done it to me for like, I'd probably say the last 10 years. My nanny at home and it's basically just chicken breast, just chopped up with, and mixed with white rice. And I don't know why, but I can eat that every single day of the week, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Like, I've had it for breakfast and then had it for lunch and then asked for it again for dinner. 
Like, I don't know why, but for me, that's the best thing ever. It's so simple. It gives you the carbs. It gives you the protein. It just makes it better. You sound like a very, you sound like a very a cheap child to keep with uh, chicken and rice. It's all you want. That's like <laughs> so, so simple. Um, well, there you go. What, what do you say what's it called again in Spanish? Arrozy? Arroz y pollo. It's basically oh, just rice, rice with chicken. Rice and chicken. Yeah, yeah. The direct translation. Simple, short and simple. How about that? Mm -hmm. uh, Tyler, you've got a, a similar question. Yeah, um, next one from Team Sergeant 2 via Instagram. Um, what's your favorite cheat meal? Ooh. I have to say, usually, 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 it's a crepe with Nutella. Ooh. But recently, here in the UAE, that Krispy Kreme and the original glazed donut goes a long way. It goes a long way, let me tell you that. Like, it's not the healthiest thing in the world, but that's why it's a cheat meal. And like, for example, in Kuwait, they had one from the hotel to the track. And we tried to go and they had to bring to the mechanics, but they opened at 11 a.m. And the session was at 10.30, so I couldn't really get to them. I think I had like two or three when I was there, which was good. That was, please tell me that wasn't on the same day. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, two were on the same day. Two were on the same day, and the oh, okay. one was another day. <laughs> do, you, do you possibly think, Sebastian, that the speed deficit on the streets is because you're loading yourself up on <laughs> all of this junk food and just adding an extra five kilos to the car? <laughs> Funny enough, my way from last year, at the end of last year, basically after Mugello, the last race, I got on the scales and I was 62.9. Right now I'm weighing 66.5. I say it's because of the food. My trainer says it's because of the amount of gym work I've done. I'm okay. not sure which one to believe. I'm uh, not sure which one to believe. A bit of both. If, you, if as long as you do the gym work to work off the Krispy Kreme, then I think you're good. Also, I love <laughs> that you say Krispy Kreme as a meal. Like that. It's, it's insane to, to answer that. But whatever the answer is, <laughs> I, I'm happy. I'm happy. And it's just big enough. It's just great. Oh, yeah, the, the, the proper quality. This final one also works as a segue um, into the next section I'll take you into. From CM Parfait 16 via Twitter, regular question asker on the podcast. Hi, Sebastian. What kind of food that, what kind of food is it that you and your dad like at the same time the most? And what kind of food do you like that your dad doesn't like? Oh, that's interesting. Um, we both like sushi. Mm. We both like pizza. We both like meat and like protein and everything. I'm not really sure what we don't like. Because before I used to like seafood, like besides sushi, like seafood, he really liked it. But now I'm starting to like it as well. So I don't really know. He, I have to say something that he loves a lot more than me to another level is ice cream. Like he enjoys really? ice cream a lot more than, yeah. Like I, I can't really tell you what something that he likes that I don't. But seafood, eh, ice cream, sorry, that, that that's a big difference <laughs> in, what, in, the, in terms of, like, he's the type of person to, like, see an ice cream thing or, like, when we get somewhere or, like, after lunch, be like, oh, you know what? An ice cream would be good right now. And you're like, oh, okay. Okay, I guess I'm, I'm fully on board of this. If, if I'm going to some races <laughs> with a three, I will get the ice cream. I love ice cream. It's just, it's just the best. So I'm, I fully support it. And this is going to it's make good, the segue yeah. naturally into the Juan Pablo section. And actually, so Ian Parfait has another question here. That's two, actually. But this one, greeting Sebastian. What was your best experience so far in doing sports car duties with your dad? And you say so far, and I don't know if you are planning to do more. Um, my favorite thing about racing with my dad, I have to probably say it was in, I'm not really sure. Uh, Bahrain was cool, even though we weren't both driving the car because the reference lap on the steering wheel was from the race. Mm -hmm. That was my dad's fastest lap of the race. And then when I got in the next day, I was just trying to beat it. So I got in for the first session. I was like, whoa, I'm three and a half seconds off. That's bad. That's bad. Like, whoa. And then they told me, no, 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 don't worry. That was, that was new tires, low fuel. Like, you don't need to worry about that. I was like, okay. Like, that, that got me worried. And then once I put the new tires on, I was able to go quicker. But I was, I was worried there for a second, I have to be honest. Then, I'm... but besides that, like, in racing, 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 probably in Petit Le Mans, because it was after Sebring that we did, we were leading, and we crashed. 
we went to walk-ins then we were leading and then we got a penalty and then to finally go and just get out of the car for your last day and just hand it over to my dad it was just kind of like we can we can we can finish this properly like finally just the win would be nice because like we we deserved it but just finishing the race on the podium would be amazing so i have to say sharing the podium with my dad and feel them all i love that answer i love that answer um Obviously, there are a few questions you bring a lot of interest because of that excellent surname you've got. But there's another, que- <laughs> there's another question from the uh, Discord user, which I think is one of the worst names that we have on the Discord, Tyler, you can ask next. Are you making me say it? I see how this works. <laughs> Brilliant. I get, in tr- I get in trouble for saying it. From uh, Crony Edgar. Brilliant. <laughs> Um, on Discord. <laughs> Has being the son of Juan Pablo helped or hindered your career? Uh, also in terms of uh, increasing opportunities and the increased pressure of having the name to perform? It's funny because it helps me in a way because at the end of the day, he's my coach as well. Like when we're at the track, he's not really my dad. He's just my coach and he's the one that's there to help me improve my driving and just be a better driver at the end of the day. Um, so I look at that as like a plus side. A negative side also is that people look at you as the son of Juan Pablo Montoya. And especially when like when you're racing in a new championship or something and they hear the last name, you don't really hear like positive things about that sometimes. Like when I was racing in the US sports cars with my dad, they would usually tell the driver, okay, Montoya is behind you. Which one now? And it was really funny because it, I, I'm not sure if it was because of previous history, but I, I was trying to pass a couple cars and then every time I would just get next to him, they would kind of like turn into me and hit me and I'd be like, it's my first race. It's my first mm-hmm. race. I, I'm sorry if I did something to you, but I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Like, trust me, I'm, I'm chill. But no, honestly, I like, guess it's good size, it's bad size. But even if I didn't have the last name, I think there would still be negatives because people always talk about you and everything. So yeah, some people race you harder. Some people are a bit more aggressive. Sometimes they go a little bit too far. But at the same time, I just took the plus side, which is my dad is probably the biggest supporter I have. And he helped me so much. And he's already made it. Like, he's won F1. He's won an IndyCar. He's won a NASCAR. He's won in WEC. And honestly, just to have him there and just guide me, I think it's a really good stuff. I was going to say, does having that sort of view from other people sometimes, um, does that motivate you further to sort of want to create your own story, obviously, and your own legacy? And I, I wouldn't really say, like, say my, like, do my own thing. Like, me and my dad are very competitive. So, like, what we always mess around with is, like, whatever he did, I just want to do better. Like, that's kind of, like, the way we look at it. Because we're it's very competitive driver. in the family. Like, very, very, very competitive. Like, even if we're playing golf, we're in the gym, we're playing paddle, like, whatever it is. Like, between us, it's just whoever does it better. So, yeah. Mm. It's, it's kind of more of, like, a family challenge thing than anything. I remember, uh, I'm just trying to see if I can find it quickly, but I probably can't find it quick enough with my Google Foo skills. But the picture of your dad, I think it was this time last year when you'd scored the win and it's like a proper celebration. He was absolutely delighted. And I feel like you said about your biggest champion instantly. I remembered just how, like, I've I've seen him win a race like in the flesh. I look more excited to see you win a race. So you, I really can yeah. feel what you say about your biggest, your biggest supporter. Um, there's a question which isn't actually around your dad, but I'm trying to turn it into it because I was trying to categorize everything. But this is uh, Nora's fantasy mm-hmm. via Twitter. What is your earliest F1 related memory other than your dad? And then I put aside from my bit and including your dad. So what do you have any Formula 1 memories what your earliest football memories that aren't anything to do with with your dad i think all my memories have nothing to do with my dad because i was still a baby so i don't really remember much mm. of that but i would probably say uh, one of the earliest memories i have is his chef in williams my the first race i went to after my dad left f1 was i think like 2014 2015 the u.s grand prix and the first thing we did is that we went to Williams. I remember we landed, we went straight to Williams. And my dad was saying hi to everyone. And then we wanted some food. So we went to the back to get some food. And the chef was the same chef that cooked for my dad when he was in F1. And the pasta he made me, I remember, was so good. I'm not sure why, but the pasta felt so good. And just the taste of it. So 
that's probably like my earliest memory. It's not a great one. It's, a, it's quite a weird story. No, 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 exactly. Sebastian. I, I love asking but, these questions. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think anybody has ever said that is their earliest F1 memory. So uh, <laughs> so, it's a really good answer. Yeah. A really good answer. Um, I think there's one more on this side of things from you, Tyler, as well. Again, from CM Parfait. You had a good few questions this week. Yeah, I know. You're picking him a lot here, Jim. Um, so he said, um, how much do you know, Sebastian, about Roger Penske and Chip Ganassi, two absolute legends that helped cement your dad's racing in the United States? I know them quite well. Like, I've seen Roger on, like, I saw Roger for a lot of years, especially when my dad was racing with them. And Chip I've seen very recently in the past few years as well because of the endurance. And now, last year, when they were doing Sea, when I was doing Sea Brain, walking to Ben and Petit Lamar, I would always see him. I also saw him in Mid Ohio. And honestly, they're really good people. They both built probably the two best teams that there is in the U.S. right now, especially Roger winning last year in IndyCar. The way they just dominated the whole season, the whole team is incredible. And the previous year, uh, Palau with Ganassi, that was also incredible. So I know them really well. And just to see the things that they've built and the two different ways that they work is really inspiring. And hopefully I can raise with them or for them one day. Hmm. That uh, actually ties in with other questions to see if I can segue this one as well <laughs> somehow. Um, if we've still got it in here. There was a question here. It is from Owen Rammel. This is in the racing uh, category, I would call. Owen Rammel via Twitter. Besides getting into F1, what other series do you dream of racing in? See what I did there? Like a professional host. Oh, that was good. That was good. I have to give you credit for that one. Um, but besides F1, I would probably... Well, not probably. I would really like to race an IndyCar just mm -hmm. because F1 is just the pinnacle of motorsports and you'd always want to dream about winning in Formula 1 because that's where the greatest drivers are. And and I think just winning in that gives you like the confidence that that might could be one of the best. And besides that, IndyCar would be like my next guess because in IndyCar, all the cars are the same. There's only two engine, engine manufacturers and just the level and the racing is so cool. Like the tracks are super cool. Like I raced Watkins Glen this year, and that's a track that you say, "Whoa!" Like I've never been like scared in a race because I'm gonna like crash or I'm like on the limit. But that's one of the tracks like I felt like, "Oh, like this is like <laughs> wow, this is like this is the real thing." And especially just because the tracks in the U.S. because most of them were built a long time ago. They're bumpy, they're hard, the grip isn't great. Either it's really good at the grip or it's very low grip. But just the racing in the US is so pure. And you also see them not only there, but in the Indy 500 and the over racing, they're fast and they go really quick. And just the precision that they need to have, it's crazy. Like I have to say, I have to say that. And then besides that, like extra things that I want to race in IMSA, WEC, ELMS. And this is like one like completely random thing. Like this is like if this happens, I would be so happy. But this is like in a couple of years, like once I've already done everything that I mentioned, is rally cross. For oh, some wow. reason, I love rally cross. Don't ask me why, but those races are so short, but they're just kind of like little sprint races. And yeah. It, no, no, no. Hard. I I love I've I've done it myself just because I get into it every now and again. I'll go on a YouTube um rabbit hole and just watch all these rally cross highlights that and you don't really need to have the highlights because like you said they're so short, but I just watch about 10 of them in a row and just it's yeah, sensational exactly. fun, sensational fun with the joke collapse and everything. Um keeping on this is MS34 Supremacy by Discord on the racing theme. This is what is the value of racing in a winter series like Fremec? Is it solely to warm up for the European season or are there other incentives? It's, I wouldn't, it's also good, like, I, I don't really know how to explain this. Like, some people use it and, like, say it's like a warm up. Mm -hmm. I personally use it this year just to understand the dynamic of the new team. Because in F3, you don't really get much track on time. So it's quite difficult to understand what a race weekend is like with the team. Um, and that's, I think, something that was quite easy with Campos when I raced with them in F3 was it, the team was, like, really easy flowing. They speak Spanish, so it felt kind of like a home. And it was a team that I already knew previously from a couple of drivers that I know that raced there. And just the dynamic of how the team works and everything is quite difficult at the beginning because it's something that I wasn't really used to. But just understanding the dynamic, the environment, and just the mood that everyone keeps. 
is something very weird because you're used to one thing and then once you change it, you're like, well, that also works too. So mm. it's just quite surprising to say like that. So I'm really using to understand that and also for the driving. I think it's really important because that during the season, you do so many weeks back to back to back to back that you don't really get any rest time. And then personally, like I had like three days off in the off season. Like I didn't, like just so you understand, I was in the Red Bull training center doing my final exams for school December 22nd. Wow. Like, it was, <laughs> yeah. Like I, I didn't really get much off time. And for me, it just kind of helps because it's tracks that I know. It's cool tracks. Like Kuwait was the first time I went there, but it's a very cool track. The drivers here are really good. So it kind of gives you like a little motivation to have some fun because it's not like your proper racing season what you're focusing on during the rest of the year but it's also good to do well it's also good for you to do the best you can do if that, that makes sense no to totally it really 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 does uh Tyler, bring it away and um yeah so if we don't get full your questions everybody sebastian's excellent to answer i love love listening to you <laughs> a couple of disappointed fans but tyler take us away <laughs> Yeah, from uh, Cesar Valero ninety eight on Instagram. Um, what thing do you consider the most significant differences between the Formula Regional and F three cars? I have to say the power. The power difference is crazy. Like the weight difference is quite similar in both cars. I think it's only like twelve kg difference between the F three and the um, Formula Regional. But the power difference is crazy because in one you go to two sixty five more or less, and in the other one you can go plus three hundred. And also the grip is quite big. So I'd have to say, besides the weight, just the power and the pure grip of the car is massive. Simple answer. I like that. I like that. We're going to move on to live here. This is from a Laurel by Discord. And you're a well-traveled man, so I'd be interested to hear your answer to this. What's been your favorite place to visit for racing or a vacation? Racing, I would say quite. I have to give it, wow. like, that's... Yeah, like the track is really cool. The track is really fun, but it's one of the proper tracks that you can really overtake and have like a race where you can come back. Monza is also really cool for racing because of the massive straight line. Um, and then for vacation, I'm not really sure. Usually when you go to the races, you don't really think about taking a vacation there, especially because when you go there, you only go for that. So the mentality is quite weird. But... I went to Imola for like a little vacation in Bologna because it's like 30 minutes away and it's quite nice. And yeah, I'm trying to think. Barcelona. I have to say Barcelona. Barcelona. Is a good, one. good answer. Good answer. Tyler, next question on the life section. Very important question. Next question from, uh, yeah, very important question on this one, Sebastian. So ready yourself. Uh, from MS34 Supremacy on Discord. What color is your toothbrush? What color? Whoa. <laughs> See, it's just Whoa. super important. If you don't know what color your toothbrush is, you can't you can't succeed in life. I know, I know it's like clear. It has like a little plastic clear thing, so it's clear, like see through, and it's black. Black. It's black. Okay. It's black. Yeah, it's black, and then like the I don't know what you call the teeth, like the hair of the toothbrush. Yeah, the the, the, but it's the brush. Blue. Bristles. Yeah, the brush part, the brush part, the bris. That is blue with like a greenish and white. Wow, I surprised myself. <laughs> do you use an electric one or are you, are you, do you go au natural with your toothbrush? No, 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 I don't use an electric one because usually I'll, I'll brush my teeth when I'm in the shower, so. Oh, what? That's, that's the question. That, that, that's that's a question hack. we didn't know. That's amazing, brushing teeth in the shower, wow. That's a life hack, that is, surely. Because look, this is the logic behind it. I'm just I'm gonna be quick with this because this is like big brains. I thought about this a couple of years ago and it saves me time. Like brain you finish the day, you finish the, the day at the track, you eat dinner with the team, you go to your room, you shower, but you don't want to get out of the shower and then like you know your hand can get wet because you're brushing your teeth and whatever. So you you brush your teeth while you're in the shower, boom, quick and easy. God, God I forbid get your hand out. gets wet. That just that's the worst thing ever. Yeah, well, you're already, to get the towel. You're already in the. You're already wet when you're in the shower, so might as well just two in one with that. Sebastian, so, how yeah. are you brushing your teeth for your hand to get so wet? I don't know. Like maybe when you're gonna like, you know, when you're gonna wet it. How do you like? How do you apply the toothpaste? How do you apply the toothpaste? Like, when does the water go? Or do you do no water? Like a crazy water, water, water at the end. To toothpaste first, then water. Mm -hmm. Final thing. 
that makes sense yeah, yeah exactly yeah if you if you put water on it first then that's like putting your milk in first that's just wrong M- milk in cereal yeah, exactly first. yeah and like and the main reason behind it is because sometimes in the hotels like when you try to open the the sink like the tap isn't there and it's happened a lot to me like I open and just like blast out and I get all wet like, with my clothes and everything. And there's nothing more embarrassing that like you have to go meet with a team at seven in the morning down at the lobby and your shirt's wet and they ask you what happened. I turned on the sink when I was going to brush my teeth and just spat at me. So I, I try to look as professional as I can. Well, I mean, of all, we, we've, asked, we've asked this question a few times, but of all the answers we've had, I don't think we've had anything as thorough as this. So thank mm. you, Sebastian, for uh, giving us an insight <laughs> into the life of a, a driver going to the tracks and having to brush their teeth. That's <laughs> an amazing answer. We'll go to the final section of Red Bull. And in fact, Tyler, you asked this first question, um, if you'd be so kind, because it's, it's a question you've asked a couple of drivers. Okay. Um, from Anush Tripathi on Discord, how is it interacting with Helmut Marco? Everybody seems to be fearful of him. How often does he actually interact with the Red Bull Juniors? It, I think it depends with every driver, but the thing with Marco is he wants you to do well at the end of the day. Like he wants, he doesn't want like any driver just to like relax or anything. He wants to make sure the driver is doing his bit. Like he's on it with the workouts, he's on it with the classes or anything that he's doing. That he's one hundred percent dedicated, basically, and he it looks very intimidating. But at the end of the day, if you see the drivers that have come through the junior program, and when they get to F one, they leave a mark. Like Sebastian Vettel, Daniel Ricciardo, Max Verstappen. These are just some of the drivers that have come through the program and shine. Like Max, in these past couple of years, he's completely shined. Like. He's the first person to, to beat Lewis Hamilton under Mercedes for a World Driver Championship. And if you see everything he did with Red Bull, and if he, it's funny enough, I remember one time in FP3 that Max was doing the quality and he shunted. And when he got back to, to the garage, the people that were waiting for him were his engineer, his dad, and Helmut Marko. And I think it's something quite interesting because at the end of the day, he's the boss. And you never want to upset the boss. You always want to do what the boss says and you always want to impress the boss. So I think it's just kind of putting that into perspective a little bit. What was your experience meeting him, your first experience? My first, so remember that race I told you I went to? Mm. And back in like 2014, 15, I was wearing a Red Bull jacket and he called, he saw my dad, he called my dad and then he looked at me and he's like, well, if you're good enough one day, we'll put you in a phone car. <laughs> and a couple of years later, I'm wearing, I'm driving the Red Bull livery car, and yeah, here I am. That's so funny. I wow. love that. I love that sort of prophecy sort of thing. Um, from the Williams garage, you're going to meet Hal Marco, and all of a sudden, look what happens. Tyler, you've got next question as well, then. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, from Isaac Hanjar's number one fan on Discord. Uh, Sebastian, be honest. Did Red Bull ask you to join the academy because you are named Sebastian uh, Vettel Bordet oh. Buemi? Or is that just is that just a theory? Um, no, they specifically said when they signed me that they wanted me just for my name, like a hundred percent. Like that's that, that was the number one priority. When they made sure they found a driver named Sebastian, and then they signed me. I've heard it say you have to be called Enzo these days if you really want to make it. That was the thing. Like the other day when I went to Red Bull, it was December, it was like middle of December, end of December when I went there, and then they texted me, and I was talking with my like. I don't know how to really say it. Like my Red Bull athlete manager, basically, from the Red Bull HQ. And she's like, okay, perfect. If you're in the hotel, Enzo's also staying in the hotel, so he can take you in the morning to the gym. And I was like, Enzo Fittipaldi? <laughs> or the ones? There's three. I don't want to ask which one. So I'm like, okay. Maybe, maybe it's all three. All three are there like, waiting for you. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, look, I... I I went into all three of their like Instagram pages and I was like, <laughs> like he hasn't posted a story. He hasn't posted a story. And then, and then Enzo Torvedishko, he's in Thailand. So, but Enzo might be because I saw him traveling back to Europe and I was like, wow, that's, so I just waited in the morning for breakfast and I asked the receptionist, like, do you know which one of the three are saying? He was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, okay. Thought that one cleared out. 
<laughs> good investigative work there. It is, it is very good investigative work. Um, I will finish it here because uh, sorry to everybody because there's been a few questions. So I'll have two questions. Uh, this one's from RBJT Updates. I uh, figured the Red Bull Junior team updates via Twitter would want to have a question asked. So is there any added pressure now that you're part of the Red Bull family, they've asked? Not really. I think I'm going to be honest with you guys. Like the person that most puts pressure on me is myself because mm -hmm. I know what I can do. And like, I get really mad at myself when like I do like stupid mistakes and stuff like that, because you're just kind of like, why? Like w what's the reasoning behind the, that? And like, it's a whole process and everything just to understand why that happens. And especially when you're trying to be hard on yourself and you're trying to improve, you don't really give yourself enough credit sometimes for what you're doing. So I'd probably say not really. Like, obviously, now I want to do better having mm -hmm. them. But there's always been pressure to perform because at the end of the day, if you want to make it to Formula One, you have to perform and you have to make sure when you get into the car, either you're quicker than your teammates or you're the quickest car on track and make sure whatever you're doing, it's working. And if it's not working, be able to adapt to whatever the situation is. So I wouldn't say so. And honestly, Red Bull, it's a really good environment. It's not... People usually look at Red Bull and it's like, oh, scary, Marco, like, oh, no. But it's actually a really good group of people and all they want from you is the best. Mm. So if you can give them best, then you can do whatever you think is best. Is Honestly, it goes quite well. Good answer. All your, in fact, all your answers have been, you probably had the best answers, just thorough and always giving a little bit more that I've ever had on the podcast. So good, good uh, shout Especially out. Especially on, on the toothbrush. That oh, toothbrush, that that was I have to say. Like, another level. First time I say it. First time I say it in public. <laughs> We've got an exclusive title. That's the title. That's the title. Just Sebastian's Toothbrush Nightmares. <laughs> toothbrush Nightmares. That's a new podcast. Let's leave it with this one. Uh, and I'm basing this off one of your earlier answers. From, Shai, from Ryan Sheehan is the GOAT via Discord. Is it good having an infinite amount of Red Bull as a junior? I'm going to caveat Red Bull sugar-free. Um... I have to say it comes in hand. It really comes in hand, especially like like people actually think, and I'm not saying this just because of promotion because I used to think Red Bull is super unhealthy, but like they actually gave me like the detailed thing of like when you can use it, what it's good for, wow. and when you should not use it. And it's really like what you cannot use it is don't mix it with alcohol. But I don't drink alcohol, so I'm fine. Like it's good after the gym, before gym, during like when you're trying to prepare for a race because electrolytes and also the carbohydrates but then also to recover it's really good um and then the sugar-free just tastes so nice like i it's it's really bad because i'm trying to just drink water like i'm not on a diet but I'm, i want to be a healthy person you know just so i can eat my crispy cream and <laughs> i <laughs> i'm trying to stay away you no know, like it's 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 Either you drink Coke for a whole week or mm. you can have a donut. I personally yeah. like the donut, but I everyone see. has their own thing. Everyone does what they do. And like, I'm trying to stick to water. And then here comes the sugar free that my sister brought to me one day. And I tried it and I'm like, whoa, that's good. But yeah, I have to say it's very nice. It's, and also not only like just being able to drink the can of the product, but like the clothes that they give you, like the hat. Yeah. I I wear this hat everywhere. Like I've I've used this hat for the past four weeks straight. Like I smelled it this morning, and then I was like, Ooh, I, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna have to order a new one soon. That insight, no, which no. I never thought we were gonna get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah make, make sure you don't sit next to anyone bad, otherwise they're gonna be complaining. Get yeah. you chucked off the floor. No, don't worry. Don't worry. My dad was next to me. We're fine. <laughs> lucky, lucky one Pablo um, well I have to say Sebastian when the Krispy Kreme sponsorship comes we want 15% that's all I'm going to say because clearly there's a, a brand ambassador here but I'm going to have to cut it short uh, cut it short there because well yeah, like I say your answers are fantastic so thank you that's all the time we have this week thank you to everybody for watching and listening 
If you'd like to have your question asked on a future episode, use the hashtag AskFS on Twitter. Drop any questions below if you're watching on YouTube. You can respond to our Instagram stories or posts or let us know what questions you have on your mind on our Discord. Look for the podcast questions channel. If you are watching on YouTube, dropping a like on the video, leaving a comment and subscribing to the channel all really helps us out. And why don't you just let us know what your favorite Krispy Kreme donut is when you leave that comment as well. If you are listening, leaving a review on the podcast platform you're listening on is greatly appreciated. Finally, check out feederseries.net for more Feeder Series insight and follow Feeder underscore series, FS Americas and Feeder Series Now on Twitter. You can find the links to all of those, plus a Twitter account for myself and everyone else on the podcast in the YouTube description or the podcast show notes. Until next time, we'll be eating Krispy Kreme donuts, and we've been the Feeder Series podcast. Goodbye.